Lagos State's governor raises alarm over resurgence of COVID-19. University of Lagos shots and Delta variants reported. What we should be doing to control this is our first discussion this morning. Uproar in both chambers of the National Assembly over electronic transmission of election results. 28 senators absent when it was put to vote yesterday and the House also defers voting to 10 a.m. today. And the Tigers are on a roll as they get set for the Olympic Games. Two games won and just one lost. Good morning and welcome to the Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's a very beautiful and wet Friday morning in the city. I am Annette Felix thanking you for joining us. Good morning and uh, we hope that you can make it uh, to work this morning with the way the weather is set up. It's basically been raining all through the week. I'm not sure you know, if, if this is ending anytime soon or this is you know, the, the, the deepest part of the rainy season. But yeah, I, 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 we're going to have a conversation very soon about talking you know, what seasons we have. You know, rainy season, dry season, we're, mm. we're going to have that conversation because I heard somewhere that those are actually not seasons. Uh, that's actually weather. Uh, but good morning. Thanks for joining us. I am Osaugi Ogbawa. All right. Now, top trend stories today. Pretty interesting news. Okay, where do we begin? Do we start with our um, Operation Safe Corridor? So, news broke. First of all, it's the governor of Bornu State, Babagana uh, Zulum, going on to say that over a thousand, you know, Boko Haram fighters had been de-radicalized, had been rehabilitated and had been integrated with society. He wasn't happy about this, and he went on to say that, you know, the Operation Safe Corridor that the president, you know, initiated in 2016 was not working, and that his fear was that these Boko Haram members who have been rehabilitated still go back to join their groups, and, you know, maybe have even gathered more intelligence to, you know, on where to attack soft spots and targets and things like that. But we have a statement from the military. They responded and basically saying, and this is a statement from Army spokesman Onye Mawachuku. He went on to explain that the statements that we've been hearing are not true. And that these people are not Boko Haram fighters. They're not ex-Boko Haram fighters. That they are suspects or suspected terrorists who have been held for a period of time, who had been thoroughly investigated, and they were found to be you know, um, innocent of any terrorist affiliation. And so they were let go after a period of rehabilitation. So we really don't know what to believe because he's going on to say that you know, these reports are false, these reports are untrue, that people simply want Nigerians to be in a, in a, in a state of panic and in a frenzy, you know, that, oh, this is security threat in Nigeria is worse than what it is. He said, and I quote, these cleared suspects are therefore not ex Boko Haram fighters as peddled in the said online reports as the masterminds would want to impress on the public and that these people, you know, were released after a rigorous process on Wednesday, July 14, 2021. So that's where we are. What do we believe? The statements from the Bonu State Governor who said this Operation Safe Corridor, which was an initiative to de-radicalize terrorists, you know, um, basically is not working. Or statements from the army saying, no, these are not terrorists. These are just people who were picked up, but we found out they're not terrorists, so we're letting them go. Uh, well, um, first one is, you know, how, you know, it's, uh, uh, government um, persons, you know, both in security and, of course, a, you know, executive always uh, try to blame people when they complain, you know, and say, oh, you know, you're, you're causing tension and, you know, completely forget that it is their inadequacies and their failures that have led to the tension. Um, that's one. And then two, uh, the um, de-radicalization program itself is the first time that I've heard about it or anybody has heard about it ever, uh, that, you know, terrorists, you know, and the, the whole idea that a terrorist can be de-radicalized um, instead of, you know, being prosecuted and jailed, um, instead of being uh, fully prosecuted to the, you know, a, a full extent of the law, um, is the first time that we're hearing about things like that. 
Um, but whether these ones are suspects, whether they're cousins to Boko Haram, whether they're the ones who used to cook food for them, whether they're just people that they picked up on the streets randomly, doesn't change the fact that there is actually the radicalization program. Doesn't also change the fact that in the past we've seen terrorists and former terrorists and the, the government own up to the fact that there are former terrorists that have been de-radicalized and they have, you know, you know, dropped their arms and they're no longer Boko Haram and so they have been de-radicalized and they've been accepted back into the uh, society. There's also a video clip of an army spokesperson saying that a, an ex-Boko Haram can even make it, you know, all the way to become president of the Federal, Federal Republic of Nigeria. And so, you know, he, he shouldn't, uh, Uyama Wachiko shouldn't, you know, act like, you know, we're, we're talking nonsense or we don't, or Nigerians don't know what they're talking about when they complain. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is from a history of the whole idea of de-radicalizing people who have killed and maimed and murdered. Even if they didn't do it themselves, they have been part of a group that has committed murders and atrocities against the Nigerian state and led to the death of thousands of Nigerian lives. And so um, it, it would never sit well with anybody. I don't think anybody is going to look at those things and say, okay, that's fine. Uh, these are just suspects. You know, they, these... Um, stories are coming from somewhere. So it, it possibly is true, according to what the governor is saying. It's also possible that they're mainly, mainly just suspect that were arrested over time and they're being set free. But the fact is, there have been the radicalization of terrorists. And, um, oh, the final thing that I will say, the you know, strong one actually is, show me 12 actual terrorists that have been sent to court in Nigeria, that have been found guilty of terrorism, that have been jailed for 20 years. Show me five. Show me two. Show me an ex-Boko Haram leader that was arrested in the course of battle and was, you know, prosecuted and was found guilty of terrorism, you know, and, you know, maybe killed a hundred people. Show me any one. Show me a bandit in Nigeria in the last 10 years that you can point to and say, okay, this person used to be a bandit, was arrested by the army or by the police and, you know, was prosecuted, you know, the, the court found him guilty of, you know, of, of these uh, crimes and have been sentenced to jail. Show me one. Mm -hmm. Show me even their, their one, one single half even. There's none. So when people complain about the whole idea of de-radicalization, don't shut them down. You know, it's, it's because of your failures. Mm -hmm. It's because you've, you, you've, you know, almost rewarded terrorism. That's what it seems like. You have rewarded. And what is a terrorist thinking in Nigeria today if I'm caught? What's going to happen? They would de-radicalize me after a couple of months. Mm. That's what it is. See, this de-radicalization program has been a subject of controversy indeed. There are articles and articles on the web, you know, of you know, scholars analyzing the impact of this Operation Safe Corridor. And the consensus that we seem to get from what, you know, these security experts and analysts have been saying is that, you know, an Operation Safe Corridor launched by the military or by the Nigerian government to de-radicalize terrorists is just showing the federal government admitting that they cannot defeat terrorism, that they, can, they cannot, you know, eliminate, you know, the Boko Haram threat in Nigeria. And also, there's the other angle of saying, oh, terrorism cannot be fought by simply military means alone. There are other, you know, non-military non, uh, means to use to engage these people, appeal to their humanity. That's basically what they're trying to achieve with this, to let them know, oh, you know, we're all humans and all of that, to basically get into their, their psyche and in, reintegrate them back to society. But the question is, what impression really is this giving the Nigerian people? If you're having situations where, you know, Nigerians who just walk in on the streets can just be shot at by a stray bullet and the person's, you know, bright future is just, you know, ends at that, at that point. And a terrorist who goes on to commit murder, commits crimes that should be, you know, we know what the punishment for these crimes should be, but then you go on to say they are de-radicalized, they are no more longer terrorists, they can now come back to society, they can now aspire to be president of a country. Mm. So it, it just still goes back to our conversation yesterday regarding loop-sidedness and, and what this really tells of when it seems that one, one group in Nigeria has been favored over another because it seems that what is good for the goose is definitely not good for, good for the gander. But that really is the impression that Nigerian people are getting, that when people from a certain area commit crimes that are so grave, they can get away with it. But when it comes to people from the other side, you know, they don't. So what, what this means is that justice needs to be done. Justice needs to be seen to be done. There has to be that principle of fairness and equity. If you're going to be going after 
um, people who are secessionist agitators and you can prosecute them in the court of law. People who are murderers, who are Boko Haram insurgents should be prosecuted in the court of law. Justice should be seen to be done across so I'll, the board. I'll just quickly mention, you know, I don't think, you know, the, the, the truth is that the government, you know, cannot. I think the government has failed, you know, because of the inadequacies, because of corruption and because of other reasons that they know personally. The government has chosen or chosen rather to allow this thing to continue for so long. Um, it cannot be because they cannot defeat terrorism in Nigeria. They can. And then second, show me a de-radicalized IPOB member. Show many of all these secessionists that have been, you know, um, um, have gone through programs by the by the government that you you know you you want to deradicalize. Is there no you know program for deradicalization of secessionist members? Is there no program for deradicalization of ESN members? There's absolutely none. Um, and so you know this this is why we are where we are. It, it's 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 sad. I want I want you, I want Nigerians to think about the thousands of lives. The thousands of people currently living in Nigeria, the ones who have also run to other neighboring countries for safety, the ones in IDP camps who lost their parents, lost their family members, lost brothers and sisters. Think about those thousands of people and tell those people that the people who committed these murders, who wiped your forgiven. family out, who wiped out your whole community and your village, have been de-radicalized. And received presidential and can, pardons. You know, yeah, exactly, can aspire to be president. Nigeria, Nigeria really... Really, it has to be a comedy skit. Oh, uh, man. Let's go to the next top trending story. This one, I don't know what your reaction to it would be, but it's about um, the war against, you know, cyber criminals. Um, we know how active the current EFCC chairman is, Abdul Rashid uh, Bauer, right? And um, he's basically been talking tough and people say, oh, he's been speaking. We need to see him act. If this is one of the actions, um, we'll find out uh, soon enough. But basically, we know that a few days ago, operatives of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, um, raided a popular hotel in Lagos, the Pactonian Hotel. And what the news said was that these members of the EFCC went to the security you know um section of the hotel they forced these operate them um, you know workers at the hotel to give them the master keys to certain rooms they went in there invaded their privacy some of them were even naked at the time of their invasion because this was around 4 a.m in the morning and some of them pled you know pleaded to be let go because they were you know not putting on any clothes and it was early in the morning saying they were not even cyber criminals but these people refused and they arrested you know reportedly arrested 30 people from the hotel and we have a statement here from um, EFCC chairman Abdul Rashid Bawa and he's saying here that hoteliers who allow cyber criminals to lodge in their hotels risk being prosecuted and jailed for up to 5 Yes, he went on to quote sections of the EFCC Act saying that, you know, when hoteliers allow cyber criminals to lodge in their facility, they're basically aiding and abetting cyber criminal, criminals and that they're contravening section three of the Advanced Fee Fraud and Other Related Offenses Act if they allow Yahoo Boys to check into their hotels. So he's saying that basically that these hotels will become accomplices. So lots of questions I have for this because we know that when you know you have to check into a hotel there are forms you have to fill and you can you know there's an option to put in your your um what's occupation. it called now? your occupation but it's not compulsory right and anyone can simply put a false information on there so how exactly would these hotels you know find out the occupation how would they verify would someone need to check in and they would need to call your employer what exactly would be the processes of verifying the authenticity of the occupation that someone has put on a form so all these bureaucracies really i, I um, really don't see how this would begin I think, to, I, to I play think out this is just another example of um, you know people heading agencies in nigeria that you know haven't thought things through before they you know spoke them or before they put them out you know, same thing we've seen sometimes with the Minister of Information, sometimes with the um, um, Abu Bakr Malami. Um, it's just another example. Um, for some people, it might be hilarious. For others, it just might be well, just another day in Nigeria. I don't even want to get into talking about the abuse and complete abuse of the rights of Nigerians that continues to happen every day. And that's why the EFCC thinks that they can storm into people's rooms at 4 a.m. and arrest them randomly, um, break whatever protocol that exists in a hotel, 
just because they feel like they need to arrest a few suspects. They have forgotten completely the need for intelligence gathering, the need to trail suspects, you know, and of course be 100% sure before, you know, any of these arrests are made. They've forgotten the, you know, use of, a, you know, an arrest warrant, you know, which almost doesn't exist in Nigeria. Um, there is that. But, um, Abdul Rashid Bawa, um, are you going to arrest pastors for allowing uh, um, in, uh, internet fraudsters uh, uh, donate money or, or, or even know, attend their church? Are you going to arrest hospitals for treating um, internet fraudsters? Are you going to arrest uh, uh, market women for selling yam to internet fraudsters? What exactly, where, where is this going to stop? You know, we, at what point is it going to not be aiding and abetting? Are you going to arrest, uh, you know, uh, Uber riders for giving them, for giving them uh, um, rides? Are you going to arrest anybody that they come in contact with? Are you going to arrest clubs for selling drinks to them? How do you know who an internet fraudster is? You know, how? You know, how well, exactly how do you tell that this person is an internet fraudster? And even if you suspect that they might be, don't they need to at least be go, go uh, put through the criminal justice system to be found guilty of internet fraud before they can be actually called internet fraudsters? So it's, it's just another day in Nigeria. Um, nothing shocking in any way. Um, but obviously, I, I don't think this was, you know, thought through before, you know, the statements were made. Then mm. um, it is really just let me show that I'm working. Uh, let me show that I'm active in this work. And we, we don't have systems that checkmate any of these people either. Uh, we don't have a, 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 a justice system, a legal system that will be able to, um, you know, sue the EFCC for whatever they did at Pactonia Hotel. So, you know, whatever you see in Nigeria, you take it. Yesterday, I still saw a black, um, small black bus along Admiralty. Um, arresting, you know, with police officers dressed like armed robbers um, with AK-47 um, um, rifles, arresting some, you know, some young um, guy that I, I drove past them. I still saw that happen in Nigeria because we have, we, we are living in a society that almost, almost um, anything goes and we just move on. Nigeria really, um, I think a lot of Nigerians need therapy. Um, because of the things that we see every day that we've gotten to accept as normal, we've gotten to see, you know, as, you know, this is normal. This is just the regular, you know, day-to-day -day activities of, of a Nigerian life. But we need therapy because of the amount of, of this um, that we see every day. Anyway, we'll take a short break. Um, we're going to go through the newspapers now with uh, G.D. Johnson, uh, who will be joining us after the short break for Off the Press. Stay with us.